Well, what do you make of that? To me, that was the highlight of my trip to Paris, getting out of the downtown core where the white liberals were and going out into the Muslim neighborhoods. I should tell you, we never actually went far. It was 20 minutes from our hotel. It was still in Paris proper within the Ring Road. If we had gone further out into the Banlieues, where there are housing projects, some of them majority Muslim, I think we would have had even more radical views. But this was actually in the city. Well, joining me now to help digest what we've just seen is my friend Marc Lebouy. He's the director of Plan de Bascule, a research website documenting radical Islam. And it was Marc and his team that helped us translate and make the captions that you saw on those screens. And Mark joins me now from Quebec via Skype. Mark, great to see you again. And thank you for your help translating all that French. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Well, I thought that talking to real French Muslims, and I don't mean official spokesmen for this Muslim lobby group or that Muslim lobby group, but just going out on the street and saying, excusez-moi, monsieur, can I ask you some questions? It, we didn't talk to hundreds of people. But between the cab drivers and, and the people on the street, I think we spoke with at least a dozen different Muslims. What was your general impression of what you saw, Mark? Well, it, it almost seems as if they all receive the same guidelines and the same narrative. Uh, deny uh, any link that the Islamic State, ISIS or ISIL, is, uh, is, uh, is linked to, to, to or there, there, there might be uh, Muslims. So. Right off the bat, there's always this first denial that comes up. So that was pretty, pretty clear. And the message is always the same. And then afterward, what I was noticing is they had a lot of trouble articulating the way that they can distance themselves from the reality of, of the Islamic State. Um, and I guess the French, uh, in general, have capitulated by adopting the term Daesh, which is a term that uh, the OIC has enforced on, on many countries to, to, to be able to say that, you know, the Islamic State is not Islamic. Uh, here's the, the, the words that we're suggesting to the media. Why don't you use Daesh instead? So there's this whole denial that, that, that was, was very strong. I mean, everywhere that all the clips that you took that we've seen, everybody was pretty much having the same narrative. And then there was this extension that was pretty amazing. Uh, not only is it not Islamic, but it must be a Jewish conspiracy, and it's based on, on the Americans. The Americans created uh, the Islamic State. Yeah. I should tell you, Mark, that I also spoke with uh, old stock French white downtown left wingers, uh, a couple of journalists, and other than some of the, you know, uh, conspiracy theories, they didn't really differ from these French Muslims. They blamed American foreign policy, not for the actual terrorism, but they reached to blame America quickly. And they, they wouldn't have a moment of discussion that Daesh, and that you're right, they all call it Daesh there. If you would have said Etat Islamique, they would have sort of understood, but they all say Daesh, the, the Muslims and the old stock white uh, French. That's the weird, the weirdest part to me, Mark. Both the Muslims in the neighborhoods and the white leftists downtown all agree this terrorism wasn't Muslim. So it's not just the young Muslims I spoke with who were all on the same page. It's the official French establishment. And one of these Muslim kids said to me, Pre President Hollande himself said it wasn't Muslim. So there you have it, almost like he was throwing that in my face is the ultimate proof. If our white French president says it's not Muslim, there you have it. Uh, it's uh, the, the power may be a fear. Uh, they've already had, just last year about it, at, at this time, we started a whole series of terrorist attacks in France that were barely covered in, in the media, but that was before Charlie Hebdo, you know, around Christmas time, this, these people driving cars and hitting people. And it just, it just gets stronger and bigger in, in, in France specifically. Um, there was one scene um, when you were interviewing these, these people on the street. It was like a cafe. They, had, they weren't speaking very, very articulate French, by the way. It was a very, very strong uh, Arabic accent and, uh, uh, and a very difficulty expressing their, their French. Um, but you can feel that it was almost explosive if... if, if you kept on persisting on saying that is there a tie between the Islamic State and Islam? They could come to the point where they would feel offended, and we know what happens when 
some of these group feel offended, then that that's what that's what's been what's been happening in France. Like, I mean, for the slightest thing, there's been massive riots. If you remember a couple of years ago, these car burning all over Paris, um, and these were the suburbs. But you can see also it's happening more and more closer and closer to the core of 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 of, uh, of Paris. So well, I think. Let me make another observation. You're talking about the kids who were sitting, the young men who were sitting in front of a bistro. Uh, they looked, especially the first one, they looked like young Frenchmen. Other than their accent and the tint of their skin, they were, they were hip, they were modern, they weren't wearing big Islamic beards, they weren't wearing um, a keffiyeh or another head covering, they weren't dressed in a bias. So these were, these were not the hardcore looking, like they, they looked young and modern and integrated. Those ones were obviously born abroad, but later, uh, the ones I spoke to later out in front of the convenience store, many of them were born in France. So these aren't radicals who have just come over from Syria, the, uh, or some of them maybe, but even the ones born in France and who look modern, they harbor either conspiracy theories or resentments or... I, I don't. It's it's terrifying to me that they are as French as could be. Uh, well, they're they're French in terms of their, their passport. Uh, they're French, uh, maybe technically speaking. Well, that's what I mean. They're legally French, like born in France, educated exactly. in France. Pass oh yeah, I mean their values are not French. Sorry, I, I was uh, too vague there. Their values are not French. Their beliefs are not French. Their information is not French. Their outlook is not French. But on paper, they are as French as Charles de Gaulle. And this is why we have to be careful when the media, uh, the mainstream media are covering the news and then they say we, we spoke with people and, and, and some of these perpetrators are, are French. They, they say that they're French national. And, and this is where all the, uh, the, the no-go zone comes in because now they're, they're finally re-talking about this because of the Belgium uh, uh, mastermind. He was in an area that was uh, considered, I think it's, uh, I think it was the Associated Press. They call it like a, a very, uh, a very uh, particular area of, uh, of, um, of Brussels. So there's these areas where they're totally isolated. The cops uh, in France, they say that they have about 750 zones of sensitive areas and about 140 of them are no-go zone, literally no-go zone. But all those 750, this, 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 this comes from French documents. What they need to do is the police department or the fire department, before they go into those areas, they'll have to calculate if they're going to get some police support before they go into these areas. So that means there's an isolation. That means they, 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 they are safe to be able to, to, to isolate themselves. And this is not new. It's uh, also, I don't know if you've heard of Youssef El Kardawi, who is more influential to the Sunni world than the Pope to the Catholics. This individual has literally said that um, Muslims should create ghettos and expand them. And the whole notion of ghettos, of isolated area, has been, has been worked, has been pushed forward since, uh, since, the, uh, since the late 80s. So that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the impact where these people are, are living amongst them. They're pretty much isolated, and most likely even in schools, if there are teachers that are most likely still French, uh, they uh, they are most likely living in fear of, of saying things that may offend these kids. The parents may hear about it and they may act. So all this is trickling down, and there's also most likely people in the police force who might be also be sympathetic to what these uh, these individuals have expressed. Mm -hmm. So you're you're going to have a lot of maybe some police interventions. They're gonna they're gonna have some omissions. They may not. They may not uh, cover certain aspects. But the, the level of cultural infiltration might be so advanced that you don't even trust that your own police force will protect you. Yeah. Well, I mean, here in Canada, we know that, for example, when the Shafia girls reached out to the police, reached out to social services, Several. Several. Uh, they they were sent special Muslim liaisons, including a yeah. woman in a hijab. So when Muslim girls ask for help, they're sent a special Muslim kind of help. And in the end, of course, there were four homicides and honor killings. Let me say one last point about the similarity between the Muslim men we just saw and yesterday's show where we saw the 
white French leftists. Both were saying the same thing, but I think, I think some of the Muslims were saying it because they don't know how to separate it, radical Islam from Islam, and, and they feel uncomfortable and maybe inspected too much or offended too much if you link the book they pray from every day with terrorism. So there's an offense there or a confusion. That's what I sense. But the white French leftists, they say the same thing out of fear. I call it true Islamophobia, being afraid of radical Islam, which if you read the Quran and if you see terrorism, you'd be nuts not to be Islamophobic, afraid of Islam. So you have everyone in France, white and Muslim, old stock and new immigrants saying it's got nothing to do with Islam. And I think the, the folks who are supposed to be on guard say it because they're terrified because not only could they get in trouble if they say it, but how do you do anything about it when you've got millions of French, including uh, Muslims, including those born in France, who hold these un-French views but are French on paper? What, how do you even go about it? One of the questions I asked all these young Muslims was, who's this war against? Because you can send the aircraft carrier to the coast of Syria, as France is doing, but what do you do when the problem is in your own suburbs? Last word to you. Go ahead, Mark. Well, the, this is where we're going to have to uh, factor in a lot more the, uh, the, the, foreign, the foreign influence into this. Uh, we, we do know that the highest level of government, Alain, has now opened up a lot more uh, tight ties to Saudi Arabia and Sarkozy before it was with Qatar. There's a lot of money flowing from these Gulf states, not just to finance uh, not just to finance mosques, but they're, they're funding uh, industries, they're funding tourism, and, and most likely Paris tourism is going to be affected by this because I guess people watching this, they're, 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 they think there's going to be more, more attacks going on. But the foreign influence is very, very important. So a lot of these politicians could be on, on uh, the payroll of one of those countries. They could also um, want to be able to say, sustain themselves economically so they want to have these contracts from Saudi Arabia where they're going to purchase all these airplanes, so they have to shut up if there's any problem that's going on in their own country where there's going to have these unacceptable mosques being built and funded and, and, and being fed by Wahhabism uh, or, or very strong Salafism type of Islam extremes. So there's a convergence. That's, that's the fear that, I, that right now there's a momentum, there's this conversion. There's all kinds of universities now that are funded by these guys. They're in the neighborhood. They're sending their own preachers in there. They're framing them. Or in French, we say en cadre. It's like they're framing them and they're, they're nourishing them. They're, 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 they're reinforcing the belief that they have it, but they're also giving them guidelines like, don't tell these people this, this, and that, because then you're going to alert them. So just tell them that Daesh is not Islam. Um, there's nothing to do. It has nothing to do with Islam. And just, just, just deny it. Mm. Um, so, and then the, on the other side, you have these newspaper lots, and there's more and more newspaper in, in, in France specifically that are also owned by Gulf State. The bosses of these newspaper, or the, 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 the editorial in chief, most likely is giving guidelines and saying, avoid using these terms, avoid yeah. saying this, let's not talk about this. That's so incredible. there's a lot of that happening more and more and more and more. So it's this omission-based type of information that is going on. And, you know, what's great about what you did is you didn't go there to hear the official statement. You went there in the streets, mm. and almost everybody that you met had the same narrative, so you can see how widespread it is yeah. and how it's, 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 it doesn't fit with the official narrative. Mark, uh, before you go, I just want to ask you, I mean, you, you helped us so much, uh, you encouraged us and you translated for us. If you had some advice for me and for us at The Rebel to do more investigative, and I wouldn't even call this investigative journalism, I would just call it journalism, what kind of things would you like to see us do in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, maybe even in the Middle East? What other things can we do to shine a light on this that the mainstream media is refusing to do for whatever reason? I'm, I got very a, a simple one. Let's go see all the departments that are receiving funding from the Middle East. Uh, they don't have to be Islamic department. For example, they could be legal departments inside all these different universities. Who is getting uh, these fundings from these countries? And then also, which politicians, for example, are receiving a free trip to Turkey, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia? And how does this affect 
their way of understanding and their way of, of, of shaping our policies to be able to address some of the problems that we're having. Because the biggest problem that we're having right now is we're not clear how we should define an ally. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe that we should call Saudi Arabia and Qatar an ally. I don't believe that these guys are partners to be able to fight the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of information out there, and it's very, very chilling to be, uh, to be in a position where we can fight alongside these people. Like, for example, the moment Turkey got involved, they, they bombarded our allies. Kurds. Yeah, the Kurds, you're right. Mark, we're out of time today, but I would love to have you back on on a more regular basis. You've been on our show before. This issue is only going to get more important. You've done more research on it than anyone else I know. It's great to have you as a friend and an ally. Let's keep in touch on this. And thanks again, and pass on my thanks to your team that helped do the translation for us, okay? Thank you for having me, and I will pass it on. Thank you, my friend. Stay with us. My final words after these messages.